Like most of us who were alive at the time, I know exactly where I was on 9-11 when I heard the news. I watched the towers crumble on a tiny TV screen in a hotel lobby in Jerusalem, of all places. And I remember thinking at the time, this is happening. This is actually happening. I don't want it to be real. So 20 years later, here we are. There are things happening right now that I really don't want to be real either, but uh, right now I'm going to focus with you on climate change. In February this year, people across Texas froze to death inside their own homes as an unprecedented winter storm kicked off this cascading failure that shut down the grid and water systems all over the place. It didn't have to be that way. This was partly the result of, of bad decisions on repairs and maintenance. Um, things that were never done that could have been done. And, but now the cleanup costs are exceeding $100 billion. The only thing that's cost the state more than that was Hurricane Harvey in 2017. This summer, we saw the other extreme with a heat dome absolutely cooking the western part of the country. Portland, Oregon hit 116 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a deepening water crisis across that whole region. It's now in its second decade of a mega drought. And there are fires everywhere, burning out of control, hotter, worse than ever, especially in my home state of California. And 2021 isn't even over yet. We're still in the middle of hurricane season. This is happening. We don't want it to be real. And decades of a well-funded disinformation and deception campaign have allowed many of us to believe that it's not real. But climate change is actually unmistakably happening. And brace yourselves because it's going to get worse. So what does it mean then to have climate security? And what is the future of climate security? Specifically, what does it mean for the Department of Defense in the United States and for the defense mission? So climate security really at its roots means weather and water conditions that are favorable to human civilization and to the natural ecosystems that we need to survive and to thrive. So we have that security now. Not everyone has reliable or equitable access to those resources, and not everyone has perfect, mild, sunny weather. But there's enough for everyone, and it's pretty much survivable everywhere. That kind of climate security is actually more the exception than the norm in the geological history of the Earth, which has been encased in ice and noxious gases at points. But for the last 10,000 years, we've had a largely stable climate, and it's allowed humanity to really flourish, to settle, to cultivate, to a whole string of amazing discoveries. Unfortunately, that is not what the future of climate security looks like. Right now, no matter what we do, we're going to see 30 years of more volatile weather and rising sea levels. So what we've seen in 2021, only probably worse. This is the hangover of the industrial age, the change that's locked into Earth's systems from 200 years of burning fossil fuels. Now, what comes after that 30-year period depends entirely on whether nations of the world can cut greenhouse gas emissions. But the scale and scope of that, of what we have to do, is just staggering. It's a monumental undertaking. Think of everything that you will do today or that you've done today, not just driving your car or flying in a plane, but all the things you plug in, the plastic bottle that your shampoo comes in, or the wrappers that are around all of your food the air conditioning that maybe is still on and that you relied on to get through this miserable summer. Fossil fuels are embedded in so many of your choices. It's part of the pattern of our society. With the disparity in the quality of life between the United States and almost everywhere else, everyone's tried to follow in our footsteps. One result of that is that the world today consumes 35 billion barrels of oil, 4 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and 8 billion tons of coal every year. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are higher than they've been in 2 million years. So that's pretty much a worst case scenario trajectory, which means the future of climate security is not bright. And that's certainly what the latest United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report says. And it also says we're running out of time to fix that before it's too late to do anything to protect climate security. I'm not optimistic. I'm not. We can't even persuade half of our population or a little over half of our population to get vaccinated in the middle of a pandemic that will kill them. So I'm not optimistic, but I'm a pragmatist. And so we have to try. 
we have to, we must. What choice do we have really? And the fact is that there are many things we can do. I think it starts with making sure that our infrastructure and our social systems are more resilient to natural disasters. And we just have this new bipartisan infrastructure bill that I think will help. Uh, and it's also not just about money it's or new money at any rate. It's also about making sure that other funds that we do spend, we spend in a climate smart way. We also, we have to invest in innovation. That means radical energy efficiency, new forms of energy, but also just different patterns of consumption. You know, electric vehicles are a good start, although they really do continue the pattern. Um, we just learned during COVID that we can break from the past in a radical way when we really have to, like working at home, which consumes a great deal less energy. We, we can cooperate with other countries and make sure that, that everyone has access to the science and the technologies and the investment they need to succeed in a post-fossil fuel global economy. And the United States will only make it if we have partners and allies in this. And that includes our biggest adversaries. Um, you know, we can't do this without China. Now, I don't really trust authoritarian governments to keep the promises they make, but I do believe that if we find a better way to live in cooperation with our allies and our partners, I have no doubt that China will be the next adopter. So climate security also has a narrower meaning as it applies to the US Department of Defense. And that's been going on for a while. I think for more than a decade, uh, DOD's looked at, um, you know, largely at how to adapt to changing conditions in the operating environment. So high heat, for example, affects the performance of equipment and of course of people. Um, and also they've looked at, they've assessed the climate vulnerability of hundreds of military bases. They, and they've gotten an object lesson in what that vulnerability actually looks like in practice in recent years. There's been billions of dollars in damage to bases in Florida and Nebraska, North Carolina and Texas. And I'm sure California is also struggling these days. So DSD is going to have to do more to understand those risks for sure, but also is going to have to invest in resilience. They may even have to consider closing particularly vulnerable bases and the communities around those bases should consider that and take it seriously. So beyond the impacts to bases, climate change is going to shape military missions, most obviously disaster response. Now, I've heard directly from uniformed and civilian DOD officials um, that they describe these missions as sort of a distraction from core warfighting business or an opportunity cost or even a dollar cost that they don't think they should have to pay. So forgive me for being blunt, but if you're watching this and you hold that opinion, it's time for you to get over it. The American people have made a big investment in the armed forces and a much smaller investment in FEMA and the State Department's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. So when, when the disaster strikes and they need help, they're gonna expect you to be there when they need you. So by all means, you should certainly consider the consequences to readiness of a rising op tempo for disaster relief, but it's really time to stop complaining and start planning ahead. You know, there's no reason, for example, that you can't engage with states and cities and other countries to build resilience left of the boom or what civilian disaster managers call blue sky times. Um, that would be a great mission for the National Guard. Um, you know, for that matter, this gives you a lifeline with the American public and with global public opinion at a time when there may be a loss in support for the armed forces and also for the defense uh, mission. So there are other more indirect ways that climate change will affect the defense mission. Um, and, and really these are consequential. They'll reshape the geopolitical landscape. The most obvious of those is, is in the Arctic. And sometimes you get this baffling enthusiasm from strategists about the sort of new geopolitical contests there. And it's true. There's an entirely new ocean opening, a new sea line of communication, newly recoverable resources. The Russians are rattling their sabers. The Chinese are looking for more land and icebreakers and all of this. Um, but I don't really think there's anything to get excited about in this because if we really get to the point where we have a blue Arctic, we've got bigger problems um, because that means catastrophic climate change is well underway. And that's when we'll see the really big impacts to, to global security. All those slow and sudden disasters I talk about, but also all the ripple effects like higher food prices and forced migration, those impacts are gonna interact with other factors like a history of conflict, like a weak government or you know, poor rule of law. There will be broadly destabilizing consequences of climate change at that point. And in fact, it's already a factor. You can see it in places like the Sahel or in the Horn of Africa. 
So in his first week in office, President Biden directed the Pentagon to do a climate risk analysis to understand this better. It's finished now, um, but I, I think it's only the beginning. Just like you wouldn't use data analysis from the future vertical lift to tell you what ground combat vehicle to buy, you wouldn't want to use data and analysis about how climate change is going to affect China or the 40% of China that has good land and water and where all the people live. You wouldn't want to use data for that to tell you what's going to happen in Central America and the way that it might empower criminal networks and, and drive out migration. You need to take each situation its own merits and understand what the risks are. So the administration is also plussing up spending in this area, and I think we'll see much more significant dollars committed in the fiscal year 2023 budget. You know, at the same time, not every significant initiative is going to be all about money. So, for example, recently the Pentagon required that its defense contractors, well, it didn't require, it requested that its defense contractors submit information about their greenhouse gas emissions in their supply chain, in, their, in what they make for the department, in their own corporate practices. And I think all of that is a prelude to stronger energy and climate resilience requirements and specifications in the acquisition process. So the big defense companies should be ready for that. And it would be nice if they saw that as a comparative advantage or a competitive advantage and not just something that they have to comply with. So I think also that the administration realistically is going to ask the Department of Defense to cut greenhouse gas emissions. It's coming, and that's fair. Um, on the other hand, you know, much has been made about the fact that DOD is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the country, and it's true. It does have a big carbon footprint. In 2020 alone, they bought 87 million barrels of petroleum fuels that cost them $10 billion, another $4 billion in electricity. That's a lot, but that's only one institution. And in fact, 98% of all consumption, energy consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions in the country come from the civilian sector. So that's where the action needs to be. Um, you know, the economic development, the innovation, the investment that it's going to take to actually get climate security, those are civilian responsibilities for the most part, the private sector, civil society, civilian agencies, and all of us personally. You know, at the same time, that's all what we need to do in the near term. As I said, the future of climate security is not bright, and we're on the path to a worst case scenario. And in fact, it may already be too late. That UN climate report talked all about tipping points, like the melting of, of ice, the melting of permafrost, um, like uh, the vast ocean currents that control the climate are slowing down. Any of those, if they happen, could be a total game changer. If those happen, or if we fail to cut emissions, then the future of climate security will mean something else altogether. And it will very much be a defense mission, in my opinion, so because such profound natural insecurity and all of that will come with it, there will be a contest for resources, everything from potable water to productive land. There will be lots of displacement and unsettled, and unsettled conditions it's, it's gonna mean more conflict. There's no way that it won't. And the truth is we don't really know when that might happen. That could be the world my great grandchildren will inherit after the turn of the century, or that could be my own reality in the next two decades. We just can't be sure. What we can be sure of is that this is happening. This is actually really happening. And if you're in the defense industry or in the armed forces, and you're assuming that the current efforts on climate security will pass in the next election, I do hope you'll reconsider. Because we as a people cannot afford to keep making this political or optional. There's just a sliver of hope right now, and we all need to grab it if we want any chance of future climate security.